are here in the year 2022. The Great Reset initiatives are being implemented right now. True, incredible scenes are shaping up on planet Earth. But what and why? Is there a historical record of events describing our planet's present economic and catastrophic scenes, climaxing with a new world order? Governments and citizens alike are asking the same questions. What in the world is going on? Be one of many to make sure you are aware and protected with the upcoming series, Signs of the Times. Signs of the Times will take place under the tent at TN Tatum Field from July 9th to July 23rd, except Thursdays. Admission, study materials, children's program, health screenings and lectures are all free. For more information, visit our website, signsofthetimesbda.org. Good evening to you and welcome to our Wednesday evening prayer meeting. It is by God's grace that we are here. He has kept us through the past day, or through this day thus far, and it is by his will that we are here. So we are thankful to be here and how wonderful it is that we can come together on a Wednesday evening to get refueled by the Spirit of God, to re-energize our Christian walk. And so as we worship this evening, we pray that his spirit will be poured out on us in copious measures. Okay, and 
Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you so much for your watch care and protection thus far through this week. It is you who have woke us up, woke us up this morning, Lord, and sent us on our way. Without you preserving, protecting, and sustaining our lives, we probably would not be here. Not probably, Lord, we would not be here. But in your divine mercy, in your divine love, you have kept us to be here. And we thank you, and thank you for the, your son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for our sins, that we have the assurance of eternal life, as much as we submit and surrender our lives unto you through him. And we pray, Lord, that our worship this evening be pleasing and acceptable unto you. We ask that you would bless each participant here, Lord, each elder, praise the um, chorister, our sister Tucker, and our musician sister Simone Tucker. We pray your blessing upon them and upon Pastor Steed, who will present a word from you this evening. May everyone, both in this sanctuary, Lord, and those who are watching on YouTube and other internet platform, may they be edified by what is said and done here this evening, we pray in Jesus' holy name, amen. Okay, just in continuing with our worship service, we want to wish happy birthday to a few members. Happy birthday to Sister Lorenzi Jackson Bean, Lorenzi Jackson Bean. Also to Sister June Swan, happy birthday to both of you on this Wednesday. Happy birthday also to brothers Kevin Arrow Rush, Kevin Arrow Rush, Brother David Small, and Brother David Cominenum. I pray and we pray that you will all enjoy this, your birthday, and that the Lord will bless you to see many more birthdays. Our service will continue at this time with Elder Fox leading us into testimony services. Elder Fox. Good evening, family. Good evening, family. How's everybody doing this evening? How many of you are glad to be here this evening? And there are those that are watching. <clears throat> How many of you that are watching are glad to be able to experience this uh, service with us? Just put something in the chat. Say, I'm glad to be here tonight. Um, so testimonies, um, what we normally do is, if anyone in the audience has, has a testimony, um, I would invite you to come forward. Um, and in the meantime, I will share with you a testimony, because as I continually uh, encourage you to always have a testimony. I myself have to be ready as well to give a testimony. So I'm just going to share a testimony with you. <clears throat> and um, it's, it's, um, it's a very, uh, I guess, uh, practical testimony. Um, uh, something that I guess some of us uh, experienced recently. So um, as, as most of you know, um, I run, and I ran in the um, Bermuda, uh, Bermuda Marathon Derby, they call it. <laughs> it's actually a half marathon, but they call it the Bermuda Marathon Derby. Um, and I've been doing it for, um, for a while now, and I really enjoy um, doing it. And there's uh, so many things that I actually learned um, from, uh, from running but especially in that race. So like, um, for example, you know, after the race, as, and as, as we, you know, in Bermuda know, the weather right now is, uh, is warm, it's getting pretty warm. And um, I was surprised after the race, um, when I mentioned to someone, they had, they had asked me, how did I make out? I said, it was, it was tough. And they mentioned to me that the commentators said it was ideal conditions. The commentator said there was ideal conditions to run a, mar a marathon, Bermuda Marathon. And uh, the only thing I can think about is, yeah, the, the commentators were in the back of a truck. <laughs> they weren't experiencing what I was experiencing. Um, so pers perspective is everything, right? Um, and, and my testimony um, is, 
uh, you know, again, we should be thankful for everything um, that we have and that we can do. So I'm, I'm thankful to be able to actually run that race. I know a lot of people um, don't want to run that race, but there are a lot of people that can't run that race for um, various reasons. So I'm thankful to be able to run it. Um, and, um, you know, throughout that race in particular, um, even though it was ideal conditions, um, being out there, it didn't seem like it was ideal. It was hot, it was humid, um, and it was hilly. Hot, humid, and hilly. And, um, and it was very difficult. And, um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, um, so I, I'm a little bit older now, um, and uh, this year I kept telling people this year was, was the year for me. You know, I've been training hard, you know, I've been, tr I've been doing a lot of miles. Um, and um, for some reason during the race, it didn't feel like that. And um, it got to a point where uh, I kind of knew that it wasn't the race that I expected it to be. Um, and I found myself encouraging myself and saying, put one foot in front of the other and make it to the finish. And, you know, the, the funny thing about that race is, is as, as you know, um, if you actually run it or if you, you are a spectator, a lot of people come out to support you and encourage you. And at times that could um, get you excited and you might actually run a bit faster than you should. Right? Um, but I, I uh, haven't experienced it before. I, kinda, I got to a point where I was like, all right, just you know, again, just make sure you get, get to the finish. And so I want to encourage each one of us, um, you know, we're all going through something. Um, we're all experiencing different things in life. And it's good to encourage others. It's good to encourage others. Um, but our focus has to be on the end. Because we can get caught up. You know, it's a long, <clears throat> it's a long race. And uh, even though some, some, might, some might look at us and say, oh, you're in an ideal situation. You know, you have ideal conditions, right? But you might not feel that way. You might be, you know, um, you might have a different perspective. Um, but as long as we stay focused on the finish and, you know, focus on one step at a time, because, you know, as Ecclesiastes says, the race is not to the swift or to the strong. Sorry, that's, oh yeah, those, sorry. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but he that endureth to the end. So I would encourage you that no matter what you're going through, one step at a time, you know, put Jesus first and focus on, on the finish. And that's my, that's my testimony. So, I'm, so as, and do we have any other testimonies tonight? Thank you. I thank God for the race of life. And um, I like the analogy that Alan gave. It just reminds me of the fact that God is always there with us. I like to think of him that he's at the beginning of the race with us. And you know, Alan, as you go certain places in that race, as you get to Barnes Corner, and uh, you think of that hill you got to get up. And perhaps you're, if you're not trained for it, your legs are really tell you you need to just slow down or just stop. But then you see all those people who are just urging you on. It's very encouraging. And I want to thank the Lord for his encouragement because I see him at the beginning running with me. He's also in uh, those people who are rooting, rooting me on and give me encouragement. He's also at the finish line. And he comes out to help me all the way in. I just want to thank him for that. And just to share a Bible text, um, to add to that, and, and uh, today I had to go for a follow-up for a medical, and it's just so good to have somebody there who understands Christianity. 
some doctors cannot speak it on the job, you know, but just to know that individuals that, that the Lord has put in place that you may not think is a Christian um, gives you that encouragement and that he too is depending on the Lord for guiding him in his um, duties as a doctor. But I want to share this text with you that gives me encouragement. It comes from Psalm 92 and verse 12 to the end. It says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. I like that part. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Every step of the way, God is there with us. He didn't tell us, Sister Tucker, after we uh, put in our notice for retirement, that we are to sit and do nothing. He never said that to Moses, and so he doesn't say it to us. So we're thanking God for showing us how to keep on running, but running with knowing that he's running with us. God bless you. Uh, just like Sister Simon, so similar to Sister Simon, I just want to thank God for encouraging us in sometimes strange ways. Um, in conversation with someone this week and listening to some of the things that some people have to go through. Some people are going through a whole lot. And oftentimes, or at least this time, it made me question myself. You know, if so many things began to go wrong in my life, would I still have faith? Would I be able to stand even though everything around me seems to be crumbling? And in some strange way, that actually encouraged me. That some individuals are going through stuff that we can only imagine, or sometimes we're not even, in ima not even imagining it. But yet they're holding on to their faith. Yet they're still praising God's name. Yet they're still pressing on. And so I just want to thank God for that kind of encouragement to say, Hey, listen, many, when you think your life is hard, and you're, you're, you're starting to shake a little bit on, 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 on the foundation. There is somebody out there who's going through a whole lot more than you. And yet they're still holding on. So that just gives me encouragement to say, you know what? Straighten up. Stand up. Strengthen up. And keep moving on. So I want to praise God for that. I just want to, I just want to, oh, sorry, one more faithful. Good evening, saints. I, too, have a testimony. You always hear about um, the Lord is uh, the apple, the church is the apple of his eye. And I'm um, this, this morning I had a devotion. I was reading um, object, Christ's object lessons. And um, um, <clears throat> I came across the scripture that says, um, if you touch his church, whatever you do to his church, he's going to do to you. I was reading about evang um, um, evangelism is mine, says the Lord. And he says, <clears throat> this church is going through. No matter what, I just like to encourage the saints that God is going to take care of us. Amen. Whoever touches his church, the Lord will touch him. And I just want to give thanks because the Lord has been good to my 
family and being good to me. That's the word. Amen. 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 Thank you. So just in, in closing, um, I just want to encourage us as we run this race to know someone that has, or to know the one that has finished the race and won the race, and that's Jesus Christ. And he says in John 14, verse 1 to 3, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Be encouraged. Amen, everyone. Amen. Good evening. As we go into our prayer song, we're going to sing, I Surrender All. If you have your hymn book, hymn number 309, I Surrender All. We're going to sing two verses. Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus. Jesus, I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasure all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all good evening all it's uh, always a pleasure to be able to come and talk to our Heavenly Father. I was thinking as we were driving, my wife and I were driving in to work this morning about how it seems like everywhere you look, people are searching for some relief from the stress and the cares of this world that bombard us every day. And as much as people are searching, inevitably the devil always will try to propose a counterfeit for really what's available, what God has made available to us. And we were talking about how, you know, mainstream now it has become for things like palm readings and crystals and all of these counterfeits, there's no other way to describe it, are prevalent in our everyday life. Where they were taboo at one point, now they're commonplace. But people, God has provided from the very beginning a means by which all of our cares all of our concerns 
can be laid at his feet. There's no need for crystals and the like. God has provided a means by which we can lay all of our cares to him. I was just reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3, in the New Living Translation, it reads, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When we are troubled, we are able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our suffering, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. God is our comforter. As much as the devil may try to provide counterfeits, God has provided the authentic means by which our suffering can be alleviated. And through that, we have a means by which we can share that comfort and relieve the anguish and suffering that others may be going through. Prayer is that means by which we get to express our concerns, our joys to our Heavenly Father. I want to give an opportunity to anyone, one person, this evening that may want to pray and then I'll close out in prayer. Um, anyone, if not, you do have a request. Sure. Lisa Smith. Okay, Lisa Smith in the hospital. Any other request or volunteers if not let us pray oh Ashua okay sister Rochelle's cousin in ICU shall we kneel dear father in heaven we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to present our cares to you. We thank you for the ability that we have to come before you in prayer. We thank you for waking us each up this morning. We don't take that for granted. We thank you for all that you have done in our lives and the way that you continue to bless us each day. Father, we want to petition at this time on behalf of uh, Sister Smith, as requested by Sister Tucker, as well as Sister Rochelle's cousin who is in the hospital, as well, as well as many others that may have fallen ill or are currently suffering from various ailments at this time. We know that you are the divine healer we know that you work through the hands of the many doctors and physicians. We'd ask that you'll go by and pour out a special unction of your healing mercies upon the individuals that we've uh, referenced, but also upon those that are uh, infirmed at this time. If it's your will, this Father, we'd ask that you would deliver them from their infirmities that they may have a testimony to share with those that they come in contact with. Father, you are the great comforter and you relieve all of our suffering and anguish. You, would, you pr promise that if we bring our cares to you and leave them there, that all of our burdens shall be lifted. 
Father, we place all of our cares in your hands, knowing that you have them already in control. Father, we want to ask that you would deliver us from any, uh, any sins that may be besetting us or may be sitting between you and us. Father, remove them from us. Help us to overcome any trials and tribulations that we may be dealing with. Father, we know that it's only through your power and your goodness that we will have the victory in all that we may come in contact with. Father, we ask that you would bless our families, our loved ones. Father, we ask that you would be with our young people. Many of our students have completed yet another school year, and we want to thank you for the success that you've granted to many of them. As they enter into these summer months, we'd ask that you would continue to provide your watch care and protection over them. Be with those students that are still in school, that they may successfully complete the, their course and the examinations that may be coming up for them in the coming weeks. Father, we are eternally grateful for each other and the support that we provide to one another on a daily basis. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into prayer meeting this evening, to be able to reconnect with you throughout through the, this midweek service. As we hear a message from on high this evening, we'd ask that it would touch each of our hearts that would go out, not just from within these four walls, but it would go out whatever means it may, whether it's through uh, the video broadcast or if it is even by us sharing with those that we come in contact with. We'd ask that you would help this message to land on fertile hearts that our lives might be forever changed. Father, prepare us, we pray, that we might be ready when you come back soon and very soon. We don't take for granted that we are living in these last days. But Father, most of all, help us to be ready. Help us to be mindful of the point in time in which you have placed us in Earth's history, that we might do our part, might do our part to ensure that we are ready and others that we come in contact with might be ready when you come back. Father, before I close this prayer, I don't want to forget the fact that our church is in um, session at the general conference would ask that you would be with the delegates as they make uh, decisions and they vote upon matters that will impact our church continue to impress upon their hearts the direction in which uh, our church should go in these times that your will might be done in all that we do and say be with also our members as we all are in the period of consideration of the positions that we may take up during this upcoming year and a half. Father, we'd ask that you would give us all willing hearts to be ready to stand in the gap where you call us to be. We know that you have given each of us a responsibility you have blessed each of us with gifts. Help us to seek out those gifts that we might be able to use them in your service, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The evening again. Our scripture reading for this evening is taken from Psalm chapter 91. Psalm 91 reading verses 9 through 12. Verses 9 through 12 I read from the New King James Version. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague Come near your dwelling. 
for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Take hope in these words. God will protect you and bear you up, even as he bear up his son, Jesus Christ. Yes, some service now. Give us this day our daily bread. You said you would supply all my needs according to your riches I have but to ask and I shall receive to go from here and share this love you gave to me to show someone who's lost and help them find their way. say amen. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. We we'll thank Simone for blessing our hearts. Let us pray together. Spirit of the living God, speak to our hearts tonight. Give us a word from the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you can turn my mic up uh, just a little bit. Uh, we want to go ahead and jump right into our cave prep. Uh, we want to get right into our cave prep tonight. Uh, those slides should be up in there. I'm assuming you have them. Yeah, let's get into it, you guys. Uh, let's get right into it. Uh, first text for tonight is Genesis chapter 20 and verse 15. What is Genesis chapter, sorry, thank you. What does Exodus chapter 20 and verse 15 say? Exodus, the 20th chapter and verse 15. What does it say? Thou shalt not what? Steal. Steal, right? Right? What does Exodus 20 verse 13 say? 
Thou shalt not, oh, you remember from last week, huh? You remember? Thou shalt not kill, right? And then let's repeat, if you would, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Let us repeat that together. Remember the Sabbath day to what? To keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy men servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in what? Six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the what? Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh and hallowed it. And then Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 says, You guys, what, what, what is up with this particular verse? What does Genesis 2 verse 7 say? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the what? The breath of life, and man became what? A living soul. Come on, let's go ahead and jump into our key text for tonight. Let's get into our key text for tonight. You should see that uh, up on the screen Matthew if you would chapter 3 and we're going to begin with verse 13 can you read that with me is that all right let's read that together then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be what everybody to be baptized by John but John tried to deter him saying I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me verse 15 says what Jesus replied, read with me, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill what? All righteousness. Then John consented. Then what does the Bible say? As soon as Jesus was what? Was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. I think it's one more verse. Come on, read with me. And a voice from heaven said what? What did that voice from heaven say? This is my son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Or as we say in the King James, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In whom I am well pleased. I've titled this message tonight, Such Scenes as He Went under such scenes, such scenes as uh, when he went under. It's an amazing thing because in this particular text, we find John the Baptist has been out there preaching his heart. Repent and be baptized. It's interesting because in these last days, uh, we are told, man, that in essence, a similar cry, or if you would, John preached in the power, if you would, of Elijah, right? And so in essence, in these last days, we have an Elijah message, which is similar to Elijah. Elijah, you know, he let everybody know, you've got to make a decision whose side you are on. John said, you've got to decide whose side you are on, right? And the same thing we find with this John, uh, and he's letting everybody know, and the people are coming. He's a powerful preacher. He's preparing the way of the Lord. He's the Lord's cousin, <laughs> Right? He's the Lord's cousin, and in essence, he is trying to let everyone know. Now, it's interesting because, it's interesting because his primary message while he's out there is to prepare the way of the Lord. He's talking a lot about God. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about this Messiah that's going to come. Yet, it seems like he doesn't quite know who he is when he shows up. It's very interesting as we take a look here, but I want to get into some of these amazing quotes uh, that we found in this great book, The Truth About Angels. Come on, take me if you would. Heavenly angels were looking with intense interest, listen to me, with intense interest upon the scene of the Savior's baptism. And could the eyes of those who were looking on have been opened? They would have seen the heavenly host surrounding the Son of God as he bowed on the banks of the Jordan. Now, I need you to understand that sometimes, if you would, even the pictures that are put out there about Jesus' baptism are incorrect. 
Okay? So yes, he was baptized in the Jordan. But it's not until he gets to the bank, as the Bible just read, if you just read in Scripture, it's not until he gets to the bank that if you would, the Spirit descends upon him and he hears the voice from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's important. Now, uh, what this particular quote is letting us know, that it wasn't just, if you would, this Spirit descending like a dove, but there was a heavenly host of angels that were surrounding Jesus, uh, though invisible to the human eye, all of heaven was right there at the baptism. Now, it's very interesting to me because uh, Jesus encourages us, if you would, to be baptized just like he was baptized. And what I love about it is that, Mr. Simon, at every baptism, there's a host of heavenly angels uh, that attend uh, the baptism when we have it right here in this place. Oh, if you could just imagine every time we put somebody down into the watery grave of baptism that there actually is a heavenly host uh, that is surrounding, oftentimes all the little kids up here and different things, but there's actually a heavenly host that is surrounding uh, and is present when we baptize someone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Next slide, next slide if you would. The Savior's glance seems to penetrate heaven as he pours pours out his soul in prayer. Well, he knows how sin has hardened the hearts of men and how difficult it will be for them to discern his mission and accept the gift of salvation. He knows that men's hearts have hardened so much that he's agonizing and he's, if you would, he's groaning. He is, if you would, begging uh, for power to be able to convict mankind uh, in this moment. Next slide, next slide. We got a few we need to cover tonight. He pleads with the Father for power to over overcome their unbelief, to break the fetters with which Satan has enthralled them, and in their behalf to conquer the destroyer. He asks for witness that God accepts humanity in the person of, don't miss this right here, okay? Understand this, understand this, that God accepts humanity in the person of his son. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? That he accepts humanity in the person. In other words, we ought to go back, if you would, to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve messed up. Uh, understand, God created everything. He created a very mature creation. He created the heavens and the earth. Everything that was made was made by him, okay? Okay? But he made Adam, if you would, and gave him dominion uh, over everything he had made. In other words, he allows Adam to operate and run earth as if Adam created everything. Yeah. So Adam gets to name all the creatures like he had something to do with its actual creation. And whatever the Bible says, whatever Adam called the animals, that was their name. Huh? Dog. And from then on, those were dogs. <laughs> cats. From then on, it was cats. Birds, butterflies. Imagine this, man. Now, I need you to grasp this concept. Don't, don't miss this, okay? God simply spoke, and we've talked about this before, but he spoke the macro and the micro came into existence. Stay with me. He spoke the macro and the micro came into existence. And he said, let there be birds. And every bird you can imagine showed up. Oh, Lord, help us. And what's interesting to me is this. Here's the interesting part. Adam is created in the image of God in such a way that he has the ability to name all these millions of creatures and give them all a specific name. His, come on now. I, I, could, I, could sit, I could sit probably 30 things in front of you right now and you run out of names trying to guess what you're going to give each one. But he has millions in front of him, but because he is created in the image of God, in the likeness of God, because he has, if you would, the mindset of God, he can actually name every single creature. Not just that's up in the, uh, in the air, not just that's on land, but even in the depths of the sea. It, the boy's down there scuba diving saying, that's a squid right there, and that right there, that's, that's, that's an octopus, and this right here, that's a lobster. And he's down there, and he has the capacity, the mind power to name all of these things. 
It's an amazing thing because even when we look at things like the pyramids of Egypt, they are a constant reminder that mankind's mind and its ability and its capacity back then greatly exceeds what we are able to do today. One of the most amazing things when you go look and you study how they built the pyramids, it's just so intriguing. I, I, and I've shared this before, but I gotta tell you, every time I think about going to the museum, I think my wife was, had a class at the museum, and was at the museum, and I gotta tell you, I got to that museum, I was looking around until I got to the pyramid, and I never left the pyramid until it was time to go, because I was determined to see how. Because the way the pyramid is built, it has these pathways that go up, right? There's a path that goes all the way around to the top. And there's a path that comes from the top all the way to the bottom. But the paths never cross. It's the most phenomenal thing you've ever seen in your life. And they'll show you how it's going up, and how it's going down. And you're looking around, and you're looking around, and you're looking around, and you're trying to figure out where they're going to run into each other. And they never run into each other. The things that they were able to do way back then, we talk about the fact that they were able to build a skyscraper, a skyscraper that went so high that it would reach above the clouds where everybody could go and live up top. And if the next flood comes, we won't be destroyed because we can all live up top. And God says, we got to get down there and confound the language because the very thing that they had thought to do, they're going to pull it off. Brilliant minds. And here we have Adam, who is not tainted, who doesn't have any sin, who's saying that right there, you know what? We're going to call that giraffe. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, it's, okay, come on, come on now. I'm talking about the mind of God. It's one thing to name them. Listen to me. It's one thing to name them. It's another thing to remember what you named. <laughs> oh, come on now. <laughs> come on, I'm talking about Adam has the mind of God in the sense where in essence, you think about, you think about him naming, come on, man. If, if you guys, if we passed 50 kids in front of you, you try to give them all a different name, and then we bring the same 50 kids back across you, you couldn't remember all their names. <laughs> he named millions of creatures. And when they passed back by, he did not forget that that was still not just a bird, but it was a raven. Huh? Not just that it was a bird, but it was a bluebird. Huh? Not just that it was a bird, but it was a cow. In essence, in this moment, he remembers everything. Why is that so significant? Why is that such a big deal? Because, but you know what? Oh, man, we don't really have that here. But you know what? In the States, when I would go and do funerals in the States, sometimes you had to do funerals at military Graveyards. Now, I got to tell you guys, man, I mean, literally, these graveyards stretch for miles. And they go for miles in every direction. You know, you have to have canes, you have to have a special, um, what they call it, you know how like when you go to Walmart out there in the States or, or Kmart, like each aisle has like some sort of letter or number to let you know where you parked your car? Right? So say, you know, this is, this is F or this is G or 3A, whatever it might be. Boss, they got so many different numbers, 6729A, 6729P. I mean, it's so far, it's so vast. Half the time, you would be very unwise to go try to find anything on your own. We follow the undertaker in the States, okay? We follow the undertaker when it's time to go and bury in these big old yards. But here's the thing. Here's what I need you to understand. You got millions and millions billions of people that have been laid to rest over time. And God not only has not forgotten one name, he has not forgotten one face. Lord Jesus. They've all returned back to the dust from whence they came. Some were eaten by sharks. Some were bur buried at sea. Some have gone through all sorts of transformations. Some were cremated. They don't even have but nothing but dust that remains. But on resurrection morning, when Jesus calls the righteous from the graves, everybody's going to come up looking like themselves. That's the mindset and the memory of God that we see even in the man we call Adam. But Adam gave all of that up, everybody. He gave all of that up. And in that moment, humanity no longer was acceptable to God. Yeah. 
Humanity became, if you would, an enemy to the heavenly kingdom. And now Jesus has showed up. God has now come in human flesh. And for the first time in about 4,000 years, humanity is acceptable in God's presence. Come on now, next up. Next up, if you would, next slide. Never before had the angels listened to such a prayer. They are eager to bear to the love commander a message of assurance and comfort. But no, the Father himself will answer the petition of his son. In other words, the angels want to be the one to say, hey, don't worry, Jesus, we got your back, we'll watch you, we got you. No, 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 Father, no, no, no. My son is calling, I'm going to speak directly to him. And there's a reason. Come on, next up, next up. Come on, next slide. Direct from the throne issues the beams of his glory. The heavens are open, and upon the Savior's head descends a dove-like form of purest light, fit emblem of him, the meek, and lowly one. Keep going, keep going. The people stood silently gazing upon Christ. His form was bathed in the light that ever surrounds the throne of God. His upturned face was glorified as they had never before seen the face of man. From the open of heaven, from the open heavens, a voice was heard saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I want you to see the angelic host around him. I want you to see Jesus looking up into the heavens. I want you to see that dove-like presence coming down and surrounding him. The glory is so majestic that everybody knows that this is no ordinary baptism, uh, that this is a very special moment in history. But keep going. The next slide says this. Here's what it says. The Lord had promised to give John a sign whereby he might know who was the Messiah. And here's the thing. You need to know that the sign that John was to have was that after the baptism that the Spirit would descend upon him. Hold on and remain on him. Not just to come down on him. No, no, once he comes down, he's to stay on him. And here's the thing. And now as Jesus went up out of the water, the promised sign was given, for he saw the heavens open. Next slide. Come on. Next slide. And the Spirit of God, like, look, look at this, man. Look, you guys need to read the prophet. Like a dove of burnished gold. <laughs> Come on now, changes the picture again. Ain't no ordinary dove coming. No, no, no. Like a dove of burnished gold just coming down and hovering up on the Messiah. It's an amazing moment. Uh, and here's the thing. Hovering over the head of Christ and a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Huh? Changes the whole scene. Big angelic host. Spirit descending like a Dove of burnished gold, resting, if you would, above the head of the master. And from the throne room, we hear, this is my beloved son. Next slide. Next slide. At the Savior's baptism, guess what? Guess who was at? Guess who came to the baptism? Huh? At the Savior's baptism, Satan was among the witnesses. Satan came to watch the baptism. Huh? Trying to figure out what's going on. He saw the Father's glory overshadowing his son. He heard the voice of Jehovah testifying to the divinity of Jesus. Ever since Adam's sin, the human race had been, listen to it, cut off from direct communication with God. Huh? Next slide, next slide. Here's what it goes, here's what it goes. The intercourse between heaven and earth had been through Christ. So in other words, before this, whenever heaven was communicating with earth, Jesus did the communication, right? I can't say Jesus, but the Christ, the Son. He wasn't Jesus yet. Jesus is God in human flesh. But the Son did the communication. But now that Jesus had come in the likeness of sinful flesh, the Father himself spoke. Ah. So in other words, before this, Jesus spoke to humanity. 
You saw that. You've seen that throughout Scripture. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? You remember Moses at the burning bush? Uh, you will remember, if you would, Joshua, when he sees the captain of the Lord's host, he's seen Jesus. You remember Abraham, when he had visitors, he's, he's actually seen Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And it's amazing to me because in those particular instances, you get a glimpse of the incarnation before the incarnation occurs. Uh, because Jesus shows up as a man before he actually came inside of a man. <laughs> Come on now. I, I, I need you to understand this. You even see this. You even see this, if you would, in the fiery furnace, uh, where he shows up as a man. Uh, even even uh, Nebuchadnezzar says, there's four men uh, that are walking in the fire, and the fourth one looks like uh, the Son of God. So understand uh, why. Because you, never, you should never forget that God always reveals himself how he will one day be, so that when you come, you will know him when you see him. Uh, you need to understand it's in the fiery furnace that he reveals himself to you. It's when you're in trouble that that he shows himself to you. It's when you are distressed, when you're on the hospital bed, when your child is struggling, that he shows himself to you. So that when you see him coming in the clouds of glory, you will know that that is your redeemer because you've already seen him when you were in trouble. It's an amazing thing because the father speaks now because somebody from the throne room needs to speak to the needs to speak to humanity and Jesus has now taken on not just humanity but the sin he has become sin for our sake come on next slide next slide he had before communicated with humanity through Christ now he communicated with humanity in Christ Satan had hoped that God's abhorrence of evil would bring an eternal separation between heaven and earth. That's what Satan's goal was. He knew that God hated evil so much that his hope was that earth would be his for the rest of his existence, that earth would belong to him, and that God would leave earth alone and let all the inhabitants of earth be under his domain and die. And I need to posit to you here just for a second that you understand uh, uh, oftentimes the question is asked, why do we have so much suffering in the world? Why do we have so much pain in the world? Why would God permit all of these things to happen in the world? And I need you to understand today that the reason why we have so much suffering and pain in the world today is because for a very significant amount of time, the devil was the ruler of this world. World. That's why we've got so much pain and suffering. That's why we have, and it's only because of Jesus that we now have hope that one day we won't have to live in this mess anymore. Amen? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Next up. Next up. We're almost done. We're almost done. Take me, if you would, to the next slide. I think there may be one more. Yeah. But now it was manifest that the connection between God and man had been restored. Huh? Jesus had to come, he had to come and die inside of human flesh. He had to die inside of human flesh. He had to take sin on and die. But not just die, he had to get up. Oh man, come on now. He had to get up. Because if he doesn't get up, then sin is too much for God to overcome. And so, yes, we celebrate the pain and suffering that Jesus went through. We celebrate the death of Jesus because he died for our sins. But you need to understand that if Jesus doesn't get up, then all hope is lost. We need him to get up on Sunday morning. <laughs> Okay, because he took our sins to the grave. He took our sins upon him. And so we need him to get up to show that heaven can overcome sin. Because if heaven can't overcome it, we're all doomed and we are all lost. Come on now, is there one more? Is, I don't know if there's any more. Is there, yeah, come on, give it to me. Satan could see through his humanity the glory of and purity of the one with whom he had been associated with in the heavenly courts. There rose before the tempter a picture of what he himself then was, a covering cherub. You remember? Come on now. There were two covering cherubs. One was Jesus. One was Michael, Jesus. And the other one was Lucifer. 
And in this moment, he gets a glimpse of where he once was and what he once occupied, of possessing beauty and holiness. Next up, next up. Give it to me now, give it to me. I think that's, that's it, that's what I thought, that's what I thought. You can take me to the closing slide, because I need you to understand that at these closing scenes, these scenes that happen at this particular moment, you must understand the gravity of them. And that in essence, when Jesus gets baptized to start his ministry, listen to me, this is starting the process of salvation. Uh, uh, because if humanity wants to be saved, humanity must be baptized. If humanity wants to walk in the earth made new, humanity must be washed, uh, if you would, in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, uh, but here's the thing, and this is something that we teach uh, oftentimes when we're preparing people for Bible studies, but you should never forget that in baptism, we signify both the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You've seen me in the pool. You've seen other pastors in the pool. We get in the pool, we have a cloth in one hand, and at that moment, we say, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. And in that moment, in that moment, the first thing I do is I cover their face. Yeah, cover their face with the cloth, signifying uh, the death of Jesus Christ. Then I put them underwater, signifying the burial of Jesus Christ. But everybody knows, and anybody that's ever been baptized is praying that the preacher brings you up. Because when you get up, you're now signifying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then the next step we do is we move the cloth away. And the first thing that the sinner, the first thing that the baptismal candidate does is he takes in a new breath uh, because he's begun a new life walking with Jesus Christ. That's why we baptize. Because that was how Jesus began the process of our salvation. <laughs> and he says that right now he is in heaven and he's completing that process. That one day you and I might all be in heaven, living out the ceaseless ages of eternity. Who says amen to God's word tonight? Your heads are bowed. Father in heaven, we thank you for the angelic host that surrounded Jesus at his baptism. Lord, we want to look at our own baptisms a different way. And I pray even now that you will, if you would, print or stamp that image in my mind that I will always remember that at these baptisms, it's not just a few angels, but there's a host of angels that are coming to celebrate the special moment when someone, because of what Jesus did on the cross, is going down into the watery grave of baptism. Help us to always celebrate this great moment when sinners come to repentance for all of heaven does and so should we. So, Father, bless us in our endeavors as we build up the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, let the redeemed of the Lord say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We're going to sing a chorus tonight. Um, what a mighty God we serve. So we're going to sing the chorus twice, the verse once, and then the chorus again. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. 
what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. I command you, Satan. I command you, Satan, in the name of the Lord, to take up your weapons and flee. For God has given me authority to walk all over thee. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Amen. How many of you were blessed tonight? You raise your hand. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. Something you heard today wasn't just for you, but it was for someone else. So I encourage you to share what you learned and what the Lord impressed you to someone else. Uh, let's follow here to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to hear your word, uh, to hear encouragement, to hear testimonies, to sing songs, Lord. We ask that as we listen to the gospel or the good news, that we will be encouraged that even though we were in sin, the blood of Jesus has saved us, and all we have to do is accept and remember, Lord, that if we are faithful, faithful to you, that we will receive you once you come again. We just ask that you will continue to be with us, bless us, bless everyone that was, that was here, and uh, bless those that were listening uh, by various platforms, and I ask that you would encourage us to not keep it to ourselves, but to also go out and share with others, Lord. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.